I am gay. You are straight. I am male. You are female. I am white. You are black. I am atheist. You are theist. I like the New York Yankees. You like the Boston Red Sox. I am transgender. You are cisgender. I am homeless. You have a place to call your home. I love pineapple toppings on pizza. You hate pineapple. I support same-sex marriage. You are against same-sex marriage. I am pro-life. You are pro-choice. I am me. You are you. At a fundamental level, you and I are at an impasse. We are polarizingly different. So what do we do? Can we do anything? These terms reflect how in society we have what is called a binary. So what is a binary? Fittingly, a binary can be described in two ways. The first way is as a system of numerical notation involving ones and zeros using two as a base. Now, the definition I want to impact is binary as a system involving two things. For example, day and night, white and black, theist and atheist. Now, within binary, we have what is called binary opposition, meaning that it's not just day and night, but it's day or night, suggesting an either or reality. And since you have either or, they're put into contest. So it's day, it's day versus night, male versus female, black versus white. And since these two things are in contest, one has dominance, meaning, day over night, white over black, male over female, pro-life over pro-choice, theist over atheist. Now, binaries are also problematic because life is more complex than just two things. Um, we say it with just um, day and slash or slash versus slash over night. Day and night suggests that day is here as a separate entity, and then night is on this side as completely different. However, we have dusk, we have twilight, we have dawn, we have evening. This suggests that day melds into night, just as night melds into day. However, um, oh, and the same way that with the male-female binary. We have male over here as a separate entity, or we have female over here as a different entity. However, the lived realities of intersex people, transgender people, suggest that these lines aren't as well defined as we thought they were. Now, binaries will continue to exist just because we have differences. I am this, you are that. Um, we have different beliefs, we have different backgrounds. What's problematic about binaries is the fact that dehumanization occurs. So to dehumanize means to divest someone of um, human characteristics or attributes, to divest them of the individuality. And it's actually relatively easy to do. If I am this and you are that, that becomes the unknown, something scary, something less human. Dehumanization is an answer to the questions why do people commit atrocities against LGBT people? Why is there such strife in interracial communication? Why does the genocide of entire peoples occur? While we do not discuss the widespread prevalence of dehumanization enough, we talk about the solution even less. So, if the problem is dehumanization, the solution is humanization. So tonight, let's learn how to humanize. 
So to humanize means to give someone or acknowledge their human characteristics or attributes. It means that you acknowledge that there's someone with rationality, emotional sensitivities, a lived experience, complexities. Since we're going to humanize, let's actually talk about humans. Um, polls and surveys have identified the four groups that are commonly dehumanized by Americans and the four groups that are commonly misunderstood. We have Muslims, we have atheists, we have addicts, and then we have homeless people. So I want each one of you to pick one of the people in these categories. Pick the person you least identify with or the person you have the most fear about. And let's do three steps to humanize them. So the first question I'll ask you, and after I ask the question, just mull over the answer. Pick one of these people and ask yourself, does this person like spinach on cheese pizza? Does this person like black or green olives on pizza? And finally, does this person like pineapple on pizza? Now think about your answer. You probably are asking, why is he asking us about pizza? Does he have some fixation that he needs to get a hold of? <laughs> well, we actually just took the first step in humanizing, which was to consider the other person's mind, also called theory of mind. When you think about their likes, you think about, oh, this person has thoughts. They have likes and dislikes. They think about the world. Theory of mind just means to attribute a mental state to someone else. And it's easy to do that to an in-group or someone who's like us, because that person's similar to us. We understand them better. And it's radically easy to think of people on the out-group and diminish their mental capacities. Psychologist Adam Waits argued in, we think our enemies are idiots and that's the problem, that this happens or doesn't happen with politics. Democrats paint Republicans as mindless and Republicans paint Democrats as ignorant. So what do we do with that? Well, theory of mind suggests that although we are different, both sides are full of thinking, rational people who care about the world and may have some good ideas. All right, take one of these people again. The second question is, how is this person individually complex and unique? This gives the answer of individuation, the ability to see each person as a complex and multifaceted being. Now, individuation is helpful because it realizes that while people have common experiences, that doesn't negate their identity and uniqueness. For example, all black people share the common experience of discrimination or stereotypes. However, each person is still a unique entity all on their own. Now, with individuation, it means that we get to see each other as someone who has their own lived experience, someone who's shaped by their family, their friends, um, their beliefs, their backgrounds, making them the unique person that they are. Now, the third question to ask, look at the person again and ask yourself, how or what do I have in common with this person? Now, you may be asking, how am I supposed to answer this question? I don't know who these people are. Well, the fact is, we dehumanize people without getting to know them, without needing to know them. So actually, we can humanize them without needing to know them as well. And with commonalities, you realize the transformative power of we. For example, I am here and you are here, but we have something in common. We. These pictures are actually taken from a famous blog called Humans of New York by Brandon Stanton. And this blog is revolutionary because we realize we. Now, take the first photo. Oh, we, yay. <laughs> so, under each photo comes a quote. This one says, volunteers from the Staten Island Muslim American Society heading back to their car for more supplies. This was after Hurricane Sandy. 
and a lot of people underneath were saying, I'm Christian and they're Muslim, but we have a common goal of helping people. We can see that they care about society and how we can help them. This is another awesome photo of um, Muslim people, and it says, I'm doing a photo project on women who wear the hijab in creative ways. My thought is that challenges and restrictions make us more creative. So we, they look different than us. Possibly you see someone wearing a hijab and you think that person is over there. Well, this person may also care about fashion. This person may also care about photography. It may look awesome doing it. So we have we. This person was an atheist and he says, I've been a deep believer my whole life, 18 years as a Southern Baptist, more than 40 years as a mainline Protestant. I'm an ordained pastor but it's just stopped making sense to me. You see people doing terrible things in the name of religion and you think, those people believe just as strongly as I do. They're just as convinced as I am. And it just doesn't make sense anymore. It doesn't make sense to believe in a God that dabbles in people's lives. If a plane crashes and one person survives, everyone thanks God. They say, God had a purpose for that person. God saved her for a reason. Do we not realize how cruel that is? Do we not realize how cruel it is to say that if God had a purpose for that person, he also had a purpose in killing everyone else on the plane? And a purpose in starving millions of children? A purpose in slavery and genocide? For every time you say that there's a purpose behind one person's success, you invalidate billions of people. You say there's a purpose to their suffering, and that's just cruel. So, you may say, I am theist, and you are atheist. There was a second photo of him with a dog, and you say, but we both love puppies. <laughs> and you may also realize that both of us are struggling with the existence of suffering on this planet. And although we may have come to different conclusions, we can also work together on how to solve it. This person is a drug addict, and she said, I cried the first time I did heroin. I'd never wanted to do it. I always spoke out against it, but I was 245 pounds at the time, and I was with the first guy who had ever showed any interest in me. So I did it to feel accepted. Now I'm always waiting for my next fix. Even when I manage to get clean, the demon is always on my back. I always thought I was too smart to be an addict. And I am smart. I sing, I write poetry. There was so much I could have done. And I cry every day of my life because I'm too smart for this to have happened to me. So the person is an addict. But then you realize, I love music too, I love poetry. What poets do you know? What poems have you read? What do we have in common? This person is homeless and he said, I've got a whole stack of books in my cart. Most of them are dance copies. I know a place where they get thrown out. How many books have you read? Thousands. So why are you homeless? I've tried to work a job a bunch of times, but then I get sad and then I get high and things fall apart. I love books too. So although I, he may be homeless and I may not be, we still have something in common. Now, think of the person you chose at the beginning of the night. Think of the differences that you realized. Now, think of them now. How did these questions affect the binary? These questions made us realize that although I may be here and you may be there, we stand on common ground. Let me be clear, this does not mean we're erasing our differences. Each person is unique and what they believe and how they identify is awesome, but they don't have to be divisive. When we consider their mind, when we individuate and when we recognize commonalities, we recognize the we and the shared space on which we live. So, take me. I am Jonathan. I am a feminist. I am queer. I am black. Surprise! <laughs> <laughs> so, what to do? There are a million different ways in which I stand on different sides of binaries than you. So what question do we ask? I think we should ask, I wonder what kind of toppings Jonathan likes on pizza.